Hi folks, you're very welcome to the Science Gallery this evening. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you could switch off your mobile phones for the event, that would be wonderful, or turn them on silent. Uh, the fire exit, in case of emergency, is the door you came in, or the door over here. Um, we're really excited uh, to have Ian Hughes here, uh, author and scientist, for the launch of his new book, uh, Disordered Minds, How Dangerous pers Personalities Are Destroying Democracies. And he is joined by pa Paul Dalton, who is clinical lead and head of the psychology... Oh, sorry, psycho... <laughs> good, yeah. Psycho-oncology <laughs> at St. Vincent's Hospital. Um, we're going to have a conversation for about 40 minutes um, and then we'll open up uh, to questions for the floor. Uh, the books are available afterwards and Ian has said that he'll stay around to sign them if anyone is interested. Uh, if you could put your hands together for Paul and Ian. Thank you very much. So um, it, it gives me uh, a great pleasure to, uh, to, welcome, to welcome you all here, uh, and in particular to welcome Ian's family. Uh, there was uh, at least one minibus, I think, <laughs> across the border sometime today. It's, it's, you, you, you're, you're particularly welcome. Um, I think like any uh, important endeavour in life, um, we don't do that solo. We do not do that as individuals. Uh, so those people, uh, who many of whom are here tonight, uh, some of whom aren't here tonight, um, play such an important role uh, in, in this book, uh, in Ian's endeavour to initiate a conversation, and a conversation that uh, maybe for some of us is challenging and some of us is difficult. Um, but as I say, like any great endeavour in life, uh, we never do it alone. So uh, as we begin our conversation, I guess I just wanted to, uh, to underline that and, then, mm -hmm. and all of those people who, who are here with you. We um, sometimes think the idea of launching a book is, is an unusual way to put it. You know, we launch boats and ships and, um, and, and you know, throw a bottle and see what happens. When we launch a book, um, in many ways, we launch a conversation that we don't know where it's going to go. We don't know where it's going to land. We don't know what it's going to bump into. Um, so I'm very happy to launch that kind of a conversation and that kind of a, a book tonight. In fact, it's a real honor to, to be asked to do that. Um, Ian and I talked a little bit about the importance of conversation the importance of the, 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 the civilizing impact of conversation when we exchange and when we, when we stretch, when we bump into each other uh, through conversation, we, uh, we, we come alive. Um, a, uh, a very wise supervisor I once worked with said, there are conversations, or these are the conversations that keep us alive. Uh, we have conversations in our, in, our, in our lives, I hope, that keep us alive. Um, and Ian has initiated a conversation here that I'm fairly sure uh, will help to keep democracy alive. We, um, I think in, in, in doing so, I think there is remarkable uh, determination and talent creativity, uh, generosity, and bravery um, to articulate, to put one's view um, out for public dissection is an incredibly brave thing to do. Um, and one um, that I think we need to uh, increasingly guard and honor and regard. Um, Tonight's format, so we, we were chatting a little bit about how best to do this, and uh, so we thought, well, actually, a conversation is much more useful. So, so we're going to have a conversation, um, and I hope in some way it will be a civilizing, uh, ennobling conversation uh, that we'll have, uh, but I'm hoping we'll all have together as, as our, as our uh, evening uh, moves on. Um, 
So I'm, uh, yeah, uh, I'm a clinical psychologist and um, with, um, and probably uh, a little bit more interested, uh, so I guess uh, maybe surprisingly a little bit more interested in public conversation uh, than individual conversation, um, which might sound strange um, from, um, from a psychologist, um, but we might get to that a little bit later too. Um, we're going to talk about, about Freud and about psychoanalysis and um, about the contribution that psychoanalysis has made uh, over the last century. Um, the contribution of Freud, initiated at least by Freud. Um, and if for, for no other reason, um, the, to, to, for us to grapple with the, um, the contribution that he made to our understanding of human nature his contribution to the history of ideas, um, whether you uh, agree or disagree, is profound. Um, his, um, his contribution um, has made its way into our conversation and our dialect and our language. And it's an indication that he probably uh, had his finger on, on something. So um, in my... Um, <clears throat> If I'm, if I'm honest with you, um, some of me, uh, in, uh, when, I, when, I, when I started to read, some of, some of me struggled with the idea of personality disorder. And I'll tell you why. Um, I think the concept of personality disorder has sometimes uh, historically been used to, to damage uh, to damage many people, to demonise and damage many people. Um, so some of my, my little battle in my head was, you know, um, can we have the conversation about leadership and about political leaders? Um, and in that, in, in this context, are we, um, are we supporting that idea um, that an, an idea that has harmed many people um, over many years. What, what, does that question make any sense, or what, what are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. The question does make sense. I guess it's a, it's a matter of balancing the damage to whom. So in terms of personality disorders, as you know, there's around about 12 of them that have been categorized by psychiatrists. Most of those disorders cause harm to the individual who has them. So like depressive personality disorder, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. They're mostly distressing to the individual who has that disorder. They aren't a danger to other people. So in the book, and in the, the ideas that I was sorry, grappling with in the book, I'm focusing on three disorders. So psychopaths, narcissistic personality disorder, and paranoid personality disorder. And the three of those disorders are, the evidence shows that they are much more dangerous to people around them than they are to the individual themselves. So I think in terms of getting a conversation around whether political leaders, and it's not just political leaders, whether political leaders or organizational managers or spouses or partners have these disorders, um, I think it's an extremely important conversation to be able to have. But what you're pointing out is the, the care that you have to have in order to have that conversation. Um, so I think if you, we're going to get around to Trump at some stage, huh? <laughs> um, so, no. so we, may, uh. we, we may as well start with that. <laughs> to my mind, to be able in the press and in general discourse, to be able to call Trump a moron or an idiot and so forth is socially acceptable. Yeah? It's absolutely acceptable to call him that but it's not acceptable to say that this person may have narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, to my mind, calling him, and, and also saying that has, has come out over this past few weeks with uh, Fear, um, Robert Woodward's book, Bob Woodward's book and so forth, to say that he's emotionally incapable and intellectually incapable of, of leadership. These things are, are acceptable. So talk in terms of being an idiot and being emotionally are acceptable language. But to my mind, they don't add anything to the conversation. There's no predictive value in calling someone an idiot or a moron. There's no diagnostic value in saying that they're emotionally unfit for office. 
Yeah. But having a conversation about whether Trump may have narcissistic personality disorder or paranoid personality disorder gives you a framework within which to try and understand what's happening. Mm. Yeah. So in, am I right in, in thinking that there's a, a kind of a, uh, a balancing that needs to be, you, you, I think mm -hmm. you're saying that there needs to be a, a balancing act here uh, between, um, between calling and naming something um, and, that whilst, and at the same time um, a sensitivity to, to how that kind of mechanism for understanding human beings has been misused historically. Mm -hmm. That yeah, yeah. So we're on we're on delicate ground, yeah. And I think part of the reason that we're on delicate ground is because of the context is missing. Understanding okay. the context is missing. Yeah. So, so, okay, say a little bit more about that. So what I tried to do in, in in researching the book, a large part of it is based on looking at four tyrants in history. So looking at Hitler, looking at Pol Pot in Cambodia, Stalin and Mao. And you look at the context within which these individuals got to power, but then you also look at the in indescribable brutality and the consequences of those individuals gaining power. Yeah. So I think that context of knowing what we are talking about potentially is extremely okay. serious. Yeah. 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 So it's not something to be bandied about loosely, to say okay. someone is, you know, a, a particular leader is a psychopath or a particular leader. Yeah. It has to be done in a way where you understand, and not, not just mental health professionals understand, but the general public understand what's at stake in terms of this conversation. And as we kind of move into the conversation, can you tell us a little bit about how you understand the distinction between personality disorder, personality difficulty, and mental health. Maybe just to kind of help us, mm -hmm. help us navigate it a little bit. Yeah. Because they're often conflated or, or confused. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that's also going back to your question about categorization and the difficulty around categorization, because it is difficult to categorize. I mean, one of the, I think, the obstacles to having the conversation, as you say, is that personality disorders are often thought of as mental illness. And therefore, to talk about that, to say someone has a personality disorder, is stigmatizing people with mental illness. But personality disorder is quite distinct from, from mental illness. Um, there is a complication there, which I'll come back to. But in terms of, of the description, mental, illness, mental illnesses are things that all of us can, at one time or another, suffer from. So mood disorders like um, depression, you know, um, anorexia, eating disorders, and so forth, um, schizophrenia. These are mental illnesses that can afflict you know, all of us at some stage or another. They are also things that, by and large, can be treated. Yeah, so they can come upon you for a period of time and be treated. They aren't an inherent part of your personality structure. Yeah. With personality disorders, they are inherent to your entire personality structure. And to explain what that means in, in psychological mm. terms, mm. what personality is, is your unique constellation of how you think, how you feel, how you interact with others, uh, the defense mechanisms you have a, about you know, not thinking about some things and so on. So your personality is your, it, it's, it's cognitive, it's emotional, it's behavioral, and it's that pattern of all of that mix that makes you you, or me, me, or anyone. Mm. Mm. With personality disorder, there is a structural dysfunction in personality. So if I can take one of the, as I say, with, with psychopaths, the structural disorder is that they're not capable of, of empathy. They're not capable of feeling emotional communication. So in a lot of communication, I mean, language is over, you know, overrated. A lot of human communication is nonverbal. Uh, a lot of it is about eye contact and about yeah. the sense you get of another person. Um, in the book, I talk about, you know, whenever, as an infant, you know, we're born and there's this dialogue that goes on with our mother and father in terms of before we can even begin to, to think or, or, or speak. But it's very much an emotional and a physical interaction. And we learn very quickly that the difference between people and things is that people can interact with us in this emotional, uh, mm. non-verbal way. Mm. Yeah. I think it was Desmond Tutu said, what makes a person a person 
is that they can relate to others as persons. That's what okay. makes us human. Okay. Psychopaths can't do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is a structural deficiency mm -hmm. that can't be, you know, you know, can't be so remedied by therapy or by... Mm -hmm. so, and it's also, as far as we know, there's a lot that still needs to be understood about these disorders, but as far as we know, that starts very early and it it's persists through the lifetime. Mm. And those, in, I mean, those, those diver, divergent views, uh, both on, I mean, mental health, its origin, um, and, and, and those um, personality difficulty, uh, a, a range of very divergent views that um, I think in, in many ways um, have um, resulted in a lot of the mental health community that I'm part of, the professional community, being very silent on these issues. <clears throat> and. Um, when we look at the origin of that, um, there's a, a, the, the gold water uh, that, that you speak about, that you write about here. Um, and, and a case that came about when um, a group of psychiatrists, like 1,200 psychiatrists, gave an opinion on a senator who was running uh, for, for presidency in the US in, six, in I think, 68 or 69, um, 60. Four, um, thank you. Um, and um, I think there was like 12, close to twelve hundred of them who who basically said that this man was unfit for presidency. Um, in an article called the the, the unconscious conservative, um, and of course uh, it had um, all sorts of ripples and resulted in the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, adopting a rule to say that um, psychiatrists um, couldn't comment uh, on someone's uh, mental health mm -hmm. without their, with having a, well, a conducted an assessment and then without their consent. Mm -hmm. um, and, you, and, and as we know, uh, with um, uh, President Trump, um, that, that debate began again in, mm -hmm. in, in uh, last year. Um, and I was very struck by a group of psychiatrists and, and psychologists who came forward and said that they had a duty to warn, that they had an ethical obligation uh, to warn about um, uh, their, their understanding um, of, of President Trump. Mm -hmm. Unpack that for us a little bit, or what, do, what are you, where, where are you and all that? Again, I think that this is obviously difficult. I think for, I agree with them that mental health professionals have a duty to, but a duty to do what? Yeah. In the first instance, a fairly safe position for mental health profession is a duty to educate. Yeah. So a duty to, to speak up without saying, you know, we know that Trump has <coughs> such and such a disorder. Because maybe you can't, maybe you can't know. Um, uh, that's arguable, but maybe you maybe that you take the position that unless you, you know, have psychiatric examination and so on, and obviously that hasn't been done with Trump, so you can't say definitively. But the mental health professionals can say, or at least their professional organisation in some way, you can understand that there's reticence or, you know, the danger in individuals going off and going in many different tangents and saying, but as an organisation they could take a, a position. And they could take a position in saying, you know, this kind, kind of behaviour, whether Trump has this disorder or not, you can make sense of some of the things that are going on if you think of it in terms of paranoia. Mm. So take, let's take an example, a very recent example. And again, I'm not saying that Trump has or hasn't. Yeah? <laughs> but, but I think... <laughs> yeah, he has more money than me, you can see. <laughs> but I don't think you need to go that far. Yeah? Because in the polarized environment that there is in the US, certainly, even if you do say that, you're likely to switch off half of the population. They're not going to listen anymore. So you failed in your, your, your aim of communicating what is an extremely important issue if you start off at that position. But you could start off by saying, now, there are th very worrying things that are going on. We should be paying attention to this. We should be trying to see, does it make sense when we look at some of the things that are, we are doing in terms of this framework, in terms of paranoia and narcissism and so forth. Mm. 
So I'll give you a very, as I say, an example mm. just over this past couple of days. It's not just over this past couple of days, but with Trump going to the United Nations uh, and attacking the United Nations itself, you know, where he's been to NATO, attacking NATO, attacking the European Union, which he'd like to see break up and so forth. I mean, this is what you'd expect of someone who has a paranoid personality disorder. A person who has paranoid personality disorder is psychologically incapable of conceiving of alliances or cooperative relationships. They're incapable of conceiving relationships that the other person isn't going to shaft me, so I'd better do it to them first. Yeah, right. yeah? Yeah. So if you begin yeah. to think in terms of not focusing <clears throat> on, on, as you say, diagnosing and categorizing and putting in a box, um, if you try and think, how do we make sense of this madness that we're in? Mm. Mm. Yeah? And mm. can these categorizations, mm. can this type of diagnostic and this knowledge that the mental health profession has, but applies mostly to individuals, can that help us make yeah. sense of the madness we're in? So, so I, what, what, I, what, I'm here, what I hear is um, maybe, um, uh, well, two things that really strike me. Number one, that perhaps that uh, we have an, an ethical obligation um, to, to, to name and articulate some of these concerns and observations. Um, but what I haven't thought about before is what you've said about perhaps the role of professional bodies in that. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to an individual, but is there a role for professional bodies mm -hmm. to, to begin to comment on some of these issues? Yeah. That's a, mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, and we've had some experience of that um, on, on this small island um, over with the last two referendums, for example, on, on, on abortion and on marriage equality, where, um, where professional bodies, I think by and large for the first time, uh, made public statements. So, so perhaps, yeah, the, the, an important piece I think for us to, for, to consider. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, very often our professional bodies um, are very aligned uh, with the state in terms of um, the state often being the primary employer for, mm -hmm. for so all, all of those pieces. Yeah. Le Pen recently uh, 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 required to undergo psychiatric yeah. evaluation yeah. just in yeah. the last few days. Yeah. What do you what do you think of that? But that's also that that goes to the point of how polarized things are because immediately when Le Pen was was say, told that she had to go for this examination, other far right leaders across Europe were saying that this was persecution. Yeah. So if it is, you know. It's how do you get around that then, and how do you get around? It's almost like immediately doing that is going to is going to polarise and going to be controversial. Yeah? But as I say, maybe taking a broader view, looking at saying, can we make sense of everything? Can we make sense of of what the far right in France stands for in terms of these disorders, yeah? the <coughs> hatred and racism and so forth? You know, again, paranoia of the outsider. Can we make sense of of collective behaviour in terms of these disorders? Makes sense of collective behaviour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do we make sense of? How do we do that? How do we make? How do we make sense and articulate uh, collective behaviour without, as you say, polarising further? Mm -hmm. I guess the example I give about Trump's inability to to stay in alliances. I mean, from a paranoid personality disorder, it makes total sense what he's doing. It also has predictive behaviour or predictive value because you don't expect this guy to change. You know, they talked before the election that he might flip and he might you know, become a nice guy and you know, look, look after alliances and so on. If you know about paranoid personality disorder, that's never going to happen. Uh, so if there was broader understanding of these disorders, then you know, there would be a, a more collective reality about, about what we're facing. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I, I say a little bit as well about, mm -hmm. because this is also, I think, the value of the knowledge that mental health professionals have, and particularly in psychiatry, and particularly around you know, the severity of these disorders. The two chapters that I have in the book around Mao and Stalin and Hitler and Pol Pot aren't easy reading. Uh, I mean, the, the barbarity, you know, the depth of, of inhumanity, that there is, and when you take Hitler and you, you, you summarise what happened in 10 pages, and you take Mao and you summarise what happened in 10 pages, 
and you're talking about the deaths of up to 100 million people. Uh, the, there is a, an understanding that the psychiatric profession have about the pathology, mental pathology, uh, that makes sense to the individuals who have these disorders and are taken as absolutely normal for the people who have these disorders. But they're insane to the rest of us. They're, they're incomprehensible. Mm. Uh, mm. But part of this conversation that we're having is we have to make that incomprehensible comprehensible. Yeah? We have to begin to understand, you know, I guess in the book I talk about too, and apologies for uh, graphic nature, but about the killing of children, of babies, in Pol Pot's regime and in the Nazi regime, where you see the same thing happening in a very different historical context, very different cultural context, completely different in terms of the, you know, the, the, the country that it happened in. But you see the same recurring patterns. And you see a descent into as absolute horror. Yeah? And it's a horror, I think, that most of us won't. We've never, hopefully, we've never been through that. The likes of you know, the Great Leap, Great Leap Forward in China, or mm. you know, Stalin's Great Terror and so on. 700,000 people were arrested and, were, and shot in a period of two years. And, Almost everyone in Russia at that time had a family member or knew someone who was taken and shot within that period. Yeah. If you're living through that, how do you make sense of it? In the aftermath, how do you make sense mm. of it? Mm. There's only one country in history I've ever made sense of it, and that's Germany. Russia hasn't made sense of what happened under Stalin. China hasn't made sense of what happened under Mao. And we live with the consequences of it. What? In what are the consequences of us collectively not making sense out of out of an experience, the experiences that you've talked about? I think we're living through it. We don't realize. We don't realize. On, there's two sides. We do, don't realize the danger we face, but we also don't realize the power that we have to stop it. Mm. Huh? We don't realize the, the value that there is. I know Aung San Suu Kyi has a quote. I know that what she's done in Burma since getting mm. into power is is you know, reprehensible. But she had a quote at the time that she was under house arrest where she said something along the lines of, you know, values like love and concern are, should not be made fun of because they're all that stand between us and horror. Yeah. So when you talk about civility, you talk about values of everything that's disappearing in the US at the moment. Yeah. Those norms of how interacting with one another yeah in a humane way, a human and humane way, yeah. that's, part, that's our first line of defense. Yeah. Once that goes and we start viewing one another as inhuman, as a threat, as something to be yeah, vilified, or then we're in. So we have the power to stop that going there. Yeah. And the, 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 the kind of scaffold, if you like, perhaps, that, um, that diagnostics um, that an understanding of, of, of personality disorder, um, I think, if used wisely, um, can facilitate that kind of a conversation mm -hmm. that isn't polarizing, mm -hmm. that can help us to remember, to, to recollect, um, and to engage in a different form of dialogue, a dialogue that's, as you say, is, is, is an absence, mm -hmm. increasingly so, an absence. Yeah. Yeah. When... I think people are often interested in, in narcissistic personality disorder, or maybe that's just me. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, psychoanalytically, tell us, help us understand it, uh, and, and maybe where we see it in leadership. Mm -hmm. I think, again, with my, the training in psychoanalysis, there's two, I think psychoanalysis is an incredible so way of thinking, an incredible body of knowledge, an incredible way of understanding the world. Uh, I guess in, in terms of my own career, in going into physics in the first instance, and the ideas that would blow your mind whenever you, mm. you know, astronomy and so forth. Psychoanalysis for me was a similar, it is a similar experience. Just a complete, completely mind-blowing in terms of how you, you look at ourselves as, you know, how we think, how we feel. Um, so. And the story that psychoanalysis tells about human development, uh, I think, is a normative story, 
And by that I mean it has, it, there's a morality that's built into human development. And again, that's not something we talk about very much. It's not something that's accepted. Huh? But this morality that's built into human development is that if human development goes well, then we turn out to be loving, caring beings. Okay, we're not, it's not Cinderella, it's not we're going to be like that every day. But by and large, our core is we get meaning from life, from relationships with other people. We get meaning from life and happiness from life, from our relationships, from love and, and interaction with others. Huh? And psychoanalysis has that normative narrative within it. If, if development goes well, people are at core, love is the, the core, love mm -hmm. and concern and relationship. Mm -hmm. um, the story that the psychoanalysis then tells about personality disorders like narcissistic personality disorder and paranoid personality disorder is that they're failures of development. And the consequence of that, which I, I really believe, and I'd really like this to be true, <laughs> because in terms of, we're talking a lot about very dark stuff, but in terms of hope for the future, if, what's, if the story that psychoanalysis tells is true, then things like violence and greed and inequality, enormous inequality that, yeah, are actually failures of development. They aren't, you know, they aren't the norm. They mm. aren't how we would develop mm. under it. Yeah? Mm. Um, and so, the two disorders, narcissism, I'll, I'll talk about narcissism, but they are actually failures of development then that have enormous consequences because the rest of us begin to think then actually it is quite normal to be extremely narcissistic, not to care about others. And we formulate our society in lots of ways to conform with that picture, which I think is a false picture, or at least a picture of, you know, that can be tied in, in at least in large part to failed development. Narcissistic personality disorder, the way that I understand it from psychoanalysis, just very quickly. Um, when you say that a narcissist has a big ego, it's actually a misnomer. A narcissist doesn't have an ego at all. An ego, ego for, the, for most of us, is that part of us that can take pride and confidence in, in the things that we do. Yeah, so you, you've done something, you take pride in it, you have a center that makes decisions for you, that guides your life, you have ethical basis on which you're, you're operating, but there's a solid center, yeah? and that's your ego. You also have a superego, which is your conscience, essentially, that says, okay, what you're doing is out of line, you should feel guilty about that, you shouldn't be doing that anymore. So for normal, in normal development, we have a well-developed ego and a superego, and the, the interaction between those two is, you know, is keeping us re relatively ethical beings. Yeah? In narcissistic personality disorder, neither of those two parts of us develop. Yeah. And in, in their place, what it remains is two other, two other parts. One of them is what's called the narcissistic self. The best way to think of this is as a small child. Yeah. So a small child who just loves dancing in front of their parents, in front of their uncles, and so on, wants to be the center of attention, just always wants to be, yeah. And that's a very necessary thing for us as we develop. We need that love, we need to be the center of attention. Um, so the, nar the narcissistic self is that part of us that just always wants to be there and getting attention and so on. The other part, with, a, with a, some of the narcissistic personality disorder, they never, they never get over that stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's continually this narcissistic mm. child just wanting to be center of attention. If someone else is getting attention, there's a tantrum. No, look at me, look at me. You know, there's huge envy, there's huge yeah, anger if someone else gets attention. The other side of it, which makes it very cruel for the person who has this disorder, is that instead of a superego that tells you, okay, feel a bit of guilt, you shouldn't have done that, but move on, you have what's called an ego ideal, which is like an external, extremely punishing parent saying you're rubbish. Nothing that you do is worthwhile. Yeah. You fail at everything. And so someone with narcissistic personality disorder has no center, but they have this narcissistic child who's continually trying to get attention. And at the same time, in this voice within them that tells them they're complete rubbish. Yeah. Uh, just one mm. final. Again, going back to Trump, someone said, <laughs> Someone said before, during the campaign, the guy gets up every day looking for a fight. That fight is internal. That fight is between this looking for attention, looking for yeah, applause, but at the same time, that voice in his head saying, you're worth nothing. And that, 
that tension is never resolved. That fight is never resolved. <clears throat> and the danger when it's lived out in, in public life is, 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 extra is, a, is extraordinary. Yeah. Um, the, 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 and the, the, the potential to influence the, the, the atmosphere uh, in which, in which we, we live our lives. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, extraordinary potential. You, you, you say, um, uh, and it was very reassuring for me to read um, towards the end of the book, that the, 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 human, the human being the human mind is extraordinarily malleable. Now that to me is is a really is a re I was very happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. It's a very it's a it's a it's a very hopeful um, a very hopeful position. Um, and you you make um, to my mind um, a very logical uh, connections between the values of democracy and how they underpin a system or a, mm -hmm. or a moral order, again, word maybe, words mm -hmm. we don't like using too much, but how they underpin mm -hmm. a moral order that leads to human flourishing. Mm -hmm. So that to me is, is probably um, the, one of the most in, for, take away from, mm -hmm. from, from, from your writing. Um, and I'd love you to hear, to say a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly as you've said, yeah, I think there is a, a moral basis to, to democracy, which again we don't talk about very much. But when you look at the history of democracy, to my mind, my understanding of history from this perspective is that it has been a long struggle, centuries, millennia long struggle, between a minority who have these disorders and in the conditions that have prevailed for most of history, they have been in the position to be in positions of power. They have. A, yeah. Those conditions have, have allowed them to be in positions of power. But if you go back to the first step in democracy in ancient Greece, where, where you know, the idea of having collective decision making and having you know, citizens having input into decisions, it lasted for a short time and then it disappeared for almost 2,000 years. Or, uh, but then with them coming back again in the American Revolution, coming back again then after the Second World War, most of the things that we talk about and when we talk about democracy are safeguards that have been put in place after atrocity. They've been safeguards that have been put in, even though the, you know, the founding fathers in the US and the, the people who wrote the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights and so on weren't using the language of personality disorder, they weren't using the language of the catastrophe that had just happened them being the struggle between, um, against individuals like this. But they were certainly talking about it in terms of we don't want this catastrophe to happen again. Yeah. So, so democracy, I think, and again, just to, to say, we think of democracy, or a lot of conversation democracy is about elections. Elections is only one pillar out of seven that I write about. And it, yeah. the rule of law is probably the most fundamental. And again, I talk about one of the big learnings for me in researching this was about the meaning of poverty. And one of the books that I read on this, The Locust Effect is the name of the book, about one of the consequences of poverty, apart from you know, unemployment or you know, not having enough to eat and so forth, of, of abject poverty, one of the biggest consequences of poverty is violence. People who are in, impoverished are vulnerable. They're vulnerable to you know, exploitation. They're vulnerable to sex trafficking. They're vulnerable to all kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah? And without the rule of law, then psychopaths and, and so yeah. on can rain, f f have free reign. And you, 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 make, you make the point about the, uh, one of those pillars, I, I think, um, being, being the place of, of a free press. Mm -hmm. uh, and my goodness, um, is that um, more relevant now, I, 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 I think, than ever. Mm -hmm. um, Ian, there are so many things that I want to, I, I really, I, I want to talk to you about. Um, I have my eye on the clock. But there's a, if you'll allow me, if the audience will allow me, two, two other little, two areas, two things I want to talk to you about. Um, it's hard, I, I think it's hard, given the conversation that we've had, and particularly just there, not to talk about probably one of the greatest problems that's facing us at the moment uh, in, in, in this state, in this democracy, is homelessness. Um, 
I was conscious of reading in reading the introduction to your book about Northern Ireland and about some recent commentary that said, well, what happened in, in 69 and what initiated, um, what led to the troubles, um, one of the key components in that was, home, was, was homes, homes for people, homelessness. And here we are uh, uh, up at close to 4,000 children without a home in this country. And my concern or fear is that how that feeds into democratizing our society, that degree of poverty and neglect. Do, can you say something about that? Or does that make sense? Am I making any sense? It's harder for me to talk specifically about the Irish situation, right? but I can talk about another... When I make the argument about democracy, a lot of the response is, and a lot of the reason for populism is because in many cases, I mean, in a lot of ways, democracy has failed. Yeah? Democracy failed during the 2008 financial crisis. Yeah? And it rewarded the people who had caused the... the the bankruptcy of the financial institutions by and large walked away. The austerity was, was put on, on population. Uh, and, and that's what we're reaping. And when you talk about the populist leaders and you talk about the context, there is a context, there's a reason why this is happening. And failure of democracy it was, is a large part of the reason. The difficulty we're in is that the people who are rising to the top as a result of, of uh, populism, the xenophobic populism, there are positive types of populism, but as a result of xenophobic populism are undermining democracy even more. But a lot of the fault of this comes down to politicians. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two levels, in my mind there are two levels of democracy. At the very basic level is what I'm writing about, that democracy is a safeguard for all of us, that we don't get dragged out of our beds at midnight, that we don't get shipped yeah. off to, yeah. that we don't get the types of horror that happened in the past yeah. and keep happening. Yeah? Yeah. Anne Applebaum, who's one of the authors that I quote in this, had said, she wrote about Stalin's Gulag and she says, I didn't write this because it, it, it will never happen again. I'm writing because this is going to happen again. Yeah? So democracy at one level is our safety net and that safety net that's necessary for us to develop as human beings and to flourish in terms of our own human nature. The second level, once you once you fulfil that level of democracy, you then have to make it work. Democracy has to be right. uh, there has to be competence. It has to be effective in addressing the the challenges that a society faces. And in that too, in many countries that has been failing. So there's a yeah, yeah there's a there's a wake up call. Yeah. There's a wake up call out of what's happening for, for yeah. democracy, yeah. as well as putting out the fire yeah. of, of, yeah. of what's occurring. And I think, I think you said at some point that democracy has been undone or has come apart in 27 countries globally mm -hmm. uh, over the, I mean, in, in, in very recently. In, there's, there's so much I want to ask you. I want to I wanna, I wanna move on a little bit and, and, and I'm really curious about the move from physics to psychoanalysis from measurement to the immeasurable. Um, many people would say that people like me uh, in, in, in the world of psychology and mental health have a physics envy, because we'd <laughs> love to be able to measure things. <clears throat> you left that world, uh, partly, and went to psychoanalysis. And I'm really curious about, um, about why. I'm really curious about maybe some people or what influenced that that move? Mm -hmm. Well, th there's one person who comes to mind. He was, a, he was a very good friend, Noel Shee, I think some may have known, have known Noel. He passed away far too young. But I was working in Dunleary at the time. I was in my early 30s, so I'd got a job and I was going to be recruiting 30 people and being manager for 30 people. And this is a daunting prospect. Huh? So I was wondering, what can I do to try and prepare for this? And I, rang, I saw the advertisement for the psychoanalysis course. And I rang Noel and said, you know, if I were to do this, would this be of any help in management? And 
I'd say he lied and said yes. <laughs> 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 it, actually, it actually makes it much harder. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so I, I started on the course, but I absolutely did not know what I was getting myself in for. Absolutely mm. not. Mm. In, and in terms of a, an anecdote of the early, early few weeks of the course, most of the other people were from um, psychology backgrounds. I wonder, is Vivian here? Yeah. One of my friends who was training at the same time. And we had a group session. Every week we had a group session, and we'd talk about Freud, and we'd talk about what, was, what we were learning about, and how that personally... You know, how, how does that relate, relate to you personally? And I was questioning everything. I was like, the unconscious, but there's no, what does that mean? And, you know, <laughs> like, like this. Give me the evidence. Yeah, yeah. Give me evidence, yeah. yeah. And one of the guys, just after a couple of weeks, says, why are you here? <laughs> yeah. says, In an existential yeah. kind of way? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he said, you don't believe a word of this. Why are you here? Yeah. So, but... I could, will I tell you about the... Please do. I think Rod Rodney is here, so my brother. There's a couple of instances where, as I say, psychoanalysis for me is, is it's, a, it's an incredible... It changes your worldview in the same way that physics would have changed my worldview when I was a teenager. Mm. Psychoanalysis changes your worldview. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and there's a couple of times when it happened, mostly through dreams, where you begin to think... Or you, begin, you see, you don't, you don't begin to think, you just... Freud, this is what Freud's talking about. When he talks about an unconscious, Freud talks about that we have two levels of thinking. One is our rational thinking that we, we understand, the voices that are in our heads. The other is this symbolic thinking that's going on, our unconscious thinking. That's, and it's actually quite a, it's a, quite a crazy type of thinking. Yeah? Um, so if you were to think this way all the time, you know, that's partly what Freud talked about in terms of mental illness. Mental illness is the unconscious breaking through. Yeah? And the, but, so I'll give you an example. One of the dreams that I had where I saw that this is, this is what Freud's talking about. This is the symbolic thinking that he talks about that's happening inside our heads all the time. So I had a dream one night that, was it Rodney, my brother, cut my hair to make me look like the comedian Don French. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> it did happen. <laughs> so Great I party, I'd say. <laughs> so I texted him the next morning and I just said, Rodney, you cut my heart to make me look like Don French. Don't do that again. <laughs> yeah? And he texted back and he said, do you remember the hairdressers that mum used to take us to when we were little boys was called the Don? Yeah? And of course, Don, is, was, that was French and Saunders, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. yeah? So this is just a, a, yeah. Yeah, this is a, a thinking, a symbolic yeah. thinking that Freud was talking about. You, you say at, at one point, you say that this book is rooted in my childish passion to make sense of how violence can coexist with wonder. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from, that passion? Yes, that comes from growing up in Northern Ireland. That comes from my dad giving me a book on astronomy you know, and just seeing, as I say, I say about how reading that stars were suns and the universe was, this, there was this universe. And, you know, as, as a child, as a teenager, just recognizing this. And I, you know, it was like, once I realized this, it was like, why is everyone getting up in the morning and going to work? It's pointless, you know? It's like, it's like, <laughs> It's like a Woody Allen movie where you're, you know, <laughs> the universe is expanding, there's no point in going to work. <laughs> uh, but yeah. but it, it was really this, as you say, this existential realization of what reality is, where, what, where we are on this little speck of earth. And, you know. So that was a real existential kind of... So never mind, I couldn't understand why people were getting up and going to work, but why were Catholics and Protestants killing one another? Why were they arguing over transubstantiation? Why did religion mean so much to people? Yeah? And this, I wouldn't say religion, I'd rephrase that. Why did sectarianism mean so much to people? And, yeah. and religion to you? Um, now? I have to be careful, my mom's here. <laughs> <laughs> For me, escaping from religion was one of the, yeah, that was a liberation, no? Einstein talks about science as being a liberation, and escaping from the dogma of religion was a, was a liberation. Yeah. Um, but 
ironically in a way, after my good friend Raymond O'Neill is here, we, we studied together, we studied quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. and at the end of my many years of studying physics and studying quantum mechanics, you get Niels Bohr, who was one of the atomic physicists from the beginning of the last century, he said that physics is not about the universe. Physics is what, about, about what we can say about the universe. And what he meant by that is that we are completely conditioned, our knowledge is completely conditioned by our physicality, by our limited brains, by our senses, the fact that we see and hear and so on, we don't have any other senses. So we make sense of the world as human beings, and so our physics is a human science. Yeah? Beyond that, there's another, there's something else. There's another quote from a physicist, I can't remember who it is, but he says, a materialist philosophy is impoverished. A purely materialist philosophy is impoverished. There is something beyond the material world that we see. But my argument with religion is not that that's, that's not true. It's that the stories that tell, religion tells us about it are far too limited. They aren't imaginative enough. What mystery is there is much greater than we are capable of knowing. In your, your, um, your generosity in, in bringing us to a little bit closer to that mystery in a way that's free of some of the historical baggage that I think not only prevents us from talking about a morality, a moral system, about compassion and about love, your if I can be, um, if I can be um, selfish about this, my I think one of the greatest contributions from your book is is a reclaiming of some of that territory, um, in a way that is acceptable to um, perhaps people who have struggled with those kinds of systems historically. Um, I think the book has, has many, many, many valuable contributions, um, but to me. Um, that's probably one of the most fundamental. I, I, I could sit here and ask you questions for at least another three hours. <laughs> it, I'm fascinated. Uh, I'm fascinated uh, and intrigued. And, um, but I, I, I am been told to keep an eye on the time. So, um, and, and after all my talk about conversations and including sure. people, <laughs> I, haven't done, I haven't done any of that. So we, we have a few minutes um, and uh, uh, to maybe take a, a question or a, a, a comment or a, yeah, so we've kind of two people, certainly, so the, there are mics and then there's someone over on my left as well, two people on my left. Uh, Ian, first of all, uh, many, many congratulations as somebody who's seen this book evolve and come to birth, so brilliant to see it come to fruition. Of course, you know I'm going to ask you now, mm. what sort of democracy? we have heard a lot of talk about democracy, and there are many varieties of it. Um, I suppose I'll just give you two options. Uh, which do you think is the best bulwark against the horrors that you describe of certain personality types getting into positions of leadership? Is it liberal democracy, or is it social democracy? I guess I'm going to cop out John now. Eh? Um, <laughs> I have to say, first of all, this is John Barry from Queens and Belfast, uh, enormously generous during the time that I was writing the book. He's one of the people who had a... You, know, you get to the... As I was writing this for years, but you get to the point where it's not coming together. Well, you think it's come together. As the author, you think this, is, this has come together. And then John reads it and says, this hasn't come together. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to spend another couple of years yeah. writing. But John's input at that stage was hugely, hugely... It's, it's a reason, part of the reason that the book is structured in the way that it is. I understand the question, John, to say that it's, it's liberal social democracy, yeah? Liberal in terms of the value of equality. Liberal in terms of, you know, whether equality whether it's of gender equality, whether it's of racial equality, whether it's of, of gay rights equality. Equality of human beings regardless of, and for me, that liberalism is about equality. The social democracy part of it, to my understanding, 
is what came out of, essentially what came out of the Second World War, the welfare state, and which is about the, the lesson that was learned from the Second World War was that in the absence of redistribution, in the, people, in, when people are destitute, they're desperate. And so the support for the Nazi party was largely fueled by, by the destitution that happened during the Great Depression. And the result of that, as I say, the pillars of democracy being built as a result of you know, not wanting this to happen again. Um, social democracy was the realization, the phrase that you know, capitalism needs you know, democracy in order to survive. You can't have a capitalism that's just, which is the way that things have gone now with the level of inequality. You can't have that level of inequality and expect democracy to continue. It's going to be undermined because you know, people who are extremely wealthy are going to have the, the, the means by which to, to shape elections, shape public opinion and so forth. So the social democracy part of things, I think, is I think they come from different different they're different pillars within the defence against these individuals, but I think they're both of them and more are needed. Mm, thank you. Thanks. So yeah. Um, hi, Mr. Hughes. Um, thanks very much for taking my question. Um, I've done a lot of research in regards to narcissistic personality disorder, and I've been watching a lot about. Um, a self-proclaimed narcissist called Sam Valkin um, and he has said that the empathy gene in the human condition is not surviving anymore and that the business mind or the narcissistic mind is like becoming more prevalent in every sort of societal structure in anywhere like any country in any world um, and it's not marginalized anymore because of the spectrum of narcissistic personality disorder, that there'd be more and more traits that would be input into business, um, let's say business constructs. Um, he mentions like a, an example that it's the guy sitting at the top that would have the smarts and you know he would have less empathy, so he would be able to let his best friend go out of his job, or he'd be able to make them decisions that would be needed to be made in order for society to be, I suppose, evolutionized further. Um, but he did mention that the empty gene is not working. And I just want to know, would you have any comment on that? I don't, I'm not saying I agree or disagree, mm -hmm. but just mm -hmm. have you got a comment? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's an, an important point that, it, that you're making. I would view it differently. In my conception of this, I'm thinking of kind of like we have a f almost a fixed percentage of people who have these disorders. And that's been the case, I can't prove this, but the, the way that I, that I think of this is, that's been the case pretty much throughout history, that there has been this minority of humans who have these disorders. And part of it is genetic, and part of it, as I say, is, is, is an upbringing. What has happened over, and in this, it's a, it's a hopeful story, what has happened over the course, certainly, of this past thousand years, has been that we have become much, societies have become much more em empathic. Societies are becoming much more equal and caring. So a lot of things, like if you think the abolition of slavery, if you think of women's rights, you think of you know, the demise of racism. I mean, at the beginning of the last century, if you take, for example, um, Martin Luther King and uh, Nelson Mandela, both of them, when they were standing up for racial equality, they were standing up for principles if you'd gone back, you know, South Africa and the American South were outposts, remnants of what was absolutely the norm at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and so I think the conditions, so we, my understanding of this is that there's a small percentage of these people who are genetically and so forth have these disorders, but the culture absolutely determines how many of the rest of us go along with mm. that. Uh, and so if you have a culture, as many describe our current culture, as the age of narcissism, um, and you celebrate inequality, you celebrate you know, enormous wealth, and that's what you get meaning, and that's the ultimate meaning yeah. in life and so forth, then you're absolutely going to get more and more people who are going to go into that, yeah. that mindset. But I don't think, it's a, I don't think we are becoming larger parts, parts of the population are becoming disordered. I think we are living by values that the culture and largely set by this minority, but we're we're moving in the, in the direction towards 
as a greed and, and uh, lack of concern for others and so forth. And can, I, can I say something on, on that too? Um, I was coming in, in this evening in a taxi and the taxi man told me that he, um, he, he left school at 14 uh, and he has a 21-year-old son with Down syndrome um, who is a student in Trinity. Now that to mm-hmm. me is, is, mm-hmm. is, 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 speaks to how we have evolved, how we are evolving as a society decades ago that child wouldn't have been seen. So I, I, I'm with you mm-hmm. um, in the direction of flow, the potential flow for humanity mm-hmm. to move towards uh, equality and inclusiveness and justice. Um, and and with the and I'm no uh, geneticist, but um, the, the, that concept of epigenetics, you know, that those genes are there like the keys in a piano, and given the right conditions or wrong conditions, they'll be pressed or played. Um, and I, I I I think it's 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 the civ- it's the civilizing dialogue, the 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 non-binary dialogue that that you're contributing to mm-hmm. that helps to create that atmosphere. Yeah. I think it's going back to the phrase that you said earlier, the hu- human mind is an incredibly malleable. Yeah? And Aoife Conduit, I thank Aoife for that phrase. She came up with that quite a while ago. But it is, if, given the conditions that we're in, we're, our mind can, can change. Yeah? We can become very you know, yeah. sort of callous towards other people, yeah. or we can, we can <clears throat> be more caring. Yeah? There's, a, there's a contagion. Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's a there's a real yeah. contagion that are um, in many ways I, I I think and we've talked about this a little bit that our 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 leaders and not just political mm-hmm. leaders but our leaders set the tone mm-hmm. yeah uh, and certainly President Trump has set the tone in terms of what's acceptable to say about about women about people with intellectual disability there's a f- there's a tone setting in all of that. Um, we probably have time for one more question before I'm, and um, maybe we'll take two because, I, yeah. So, uh, we, Jim, we'll go here first and then come to you if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Um, a number of things I would like to bring up, but maybe if you're conscious of time, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short. Uh, in the question of Western democracy um, and the rule of law, which you know most of us would agree with, but if there is serious inequality that, and, and people don't have access to the law when they need it to defend them, then you don't really have it for most people. Also, the West has a huge arms industry and exploit situations, conflict situations in other parts of the world to trade in arms. Um, now, linked to that, how would you see, um, or how would you look at what conditions that Bush and Blair were suffering from when they started the the trail in Iraq that still is happening to this day. Yeah, I'm glad he asked you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I guess yeah. I'll answer your question in a, in a broad way. I, I don't want to be again naming individuals, and um, but I think the following on from the conversation, the question that we've just had. The idea of global development, which again Trump is a big opponent of, but stopping violence in other parts of the world is absolutely essential for for global development. Violence is one of the the conditions under which people with these disorders flourish most readily. So what's happened happened as a consequence of of Bush and Blair's decision to go into Iraq, there was a a chain of events that led to ISIS, that led to Al-Qaeda first and then to ISIS and so forth. eh? Um, and in organizations like that, they are deeply psychopathic organizations. Huh? But again, you look at the conditions that, that empowered that. The way to stop that kind of thing is to stop the violence. The way to stop that is through development. Huh? Um, I think Jason Stearns, I think, is the author who talked about, it was a different context, the war in Democratic Republic of Congo. But he talked about war or violence as being a centrifuge. As soon as this centrifuge starts spinning, then anyone with normal psychology will be thrown to the edges. The only people that will be left at the centre in terms of making decision makers will be the ruthless and the the brutal. Um, 
So I don't know if that answers your question, but absolutely. You. If Thank we're you. looking to try and get a world in which people with these disorders have much less in influence, then certainly the arms trade, violence, war in other countries is the number one place to start. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. We'll, we'll take one more, if that's, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, uh, hello? Okay, I wanted to thank you for the talk, and I'm looking forward to reading the book. I, I think I come from the land of stable genius for the first half of my life. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been uh, uh, in Ireland, you know, for about half my life as well. And I think one of the differences than what we're seeing now is the appeal of this kind of personality mm. is really not coming mm. from the kind of trauma that we're seeing, mm. you know, China was at war effectively for the mm. entire 20th century up until now. World War I was far more devastating than, you know, Western history makes it for Russia, um, and it was a two-front war effectively with the loss to Japan. I mean, all of these mm. things had remarkable levels of trauma mm. that don't explain exactly why populations, I think, are voting for these kinds of things. And the financial crisis, I think, is part of it. But I think there's a, mm -hmm. a reason why Trump polls, for example, twice whatever that is in Europe. You know? and, mm -hmm. and we, you know, that's a big question. But I think there's a level of organization of Trumpism rather than Trump yeah. that needs to be explored. Absolutely. But yeah. I also think yeah. just at the level of the individual, you're cherry picking Freud because Freud, after World War I, comes up with another instinct, which is the death instinct. Mm -hmm. And that idea that we occasionally just, you know, part of our brain really does want to knock things over just to see mm -hmm. how it falls. And that, you know, and, and, you know that, that he's not as optimistic. There's something much more tragic in Freud, I think, than, than you know, what you're laying out. So mm -hmm. I'd like to push you yeah. a little bit on that. Also, I'm an anthropologist and I'm a psychological anthropologist. <laughs> so, so I better be careful how I answer it. Uh, absolutely. One of the most frightening things that I think out, out of what's happening in the US at the moment is exactly what you say. It's not out of trauma. So. And the only way that I can make sense of that is what's happening is largely a result of hate mongering. And Trump is a very effective hate monger. Um, so he, he is, you know, his, his hate campaign against Hillary Clinton in the, in the election was extremely effective. Um, his hate mongering of immigrants, of, um, yeah, it, that's essentially, his rallies are all hate mongering rallies. Huh? So he, he, he riles up his base through hate mongering. But, but again, there's two sides to that. There's the hate monger himself, and then there's the demand for that hatred. And what is it about American society now that there is so much demand for Trump's hatred? Um, mm. That's, I agree with you, that's the most frightening part of it. It's frightening, but it's also, there's a huge opportunity here to try and understand what's happening. Yeah? For most of us, we wouldn't have believed. You read about the 1930s and you read about the rise of Nazism and so on, and you consign it to history, you think that couldn't happen again. Yeah. And then you begin watching it happening. You begin to watch the, you know, the individuals coming on CNN and lying through their teeth and hate mongering yeah. on his behalf, and yeah, it's happening all over again. Yeah. There is no American I know in Ireland who is surprised even remotely. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. We actually had a panel in there, and it was political scientists in Ireland and expats. Every expat predicted Trump was going to win. So I, you know, I, 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 as a kind of, as I say, native. In mm -hmm. that case, Trump is a very recognizable guy. Uh, the odd thing is everybody knew Trump. I mean, he had a career where he behaved exactly yeah. like that. And I think that that's the big mm -hmm. question mm -hmm. that, you know, and I think Ireland is reflexively a very and it mm -hmm. has a very challenging time, you know, thinking, wow, that country might vote for that you, person. <clears throat> yeah. The second part of your question, sorry. Was the death instinct. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Well, I think Freud did have a darker side. Um, I think he lived through the First World War and then he escaped um, to London just before the Poland, the invasion of Poland. Three of his sisters were killed in the concentration camps. He never, he never knew that. He died before he found, before that, he he learned that. Um, 
So his, he was writing about death instinct in, the, in that context. Huh? Personally, I don't think that what most of us as individuals have a death instinct. I think my conception of being human is, is about life. I think, I think we share much more with plants than, than we give ourselves credit to. Yeah. <laughs> we, want to we want to live, yeah. we want to grow, we, yeah. want to go, we want environments that are going to allow us to challenge us, to grow, to, to break out. And, yeah. Life is for living, yeah. I'm going to burst into song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't you, see, you know, yeah. I think, again, we're, we don't have time, but I don't see it as an inherent part of, or a, a strong part of human nature. You, um, in, you to maybe to move towards conclusion, you, you, you make the point um, several times in your book um, how the kind of hyper individualism um, and rampant social inequality um, are, are are the ingredients to to bring to bring out the environment in which the kind of worst mm-hmm. of human potential flourishes. Um, and um, and you offer you you offer an an anti an antidote to that by by in many ways the reclamation of some of the language the, again the mm-hmm. civilizing conversation. Um, I was very uh, aware of of the little you who tried to to grapple with the um, the brutality and the wonder, the, the potential of human nature to do that. And, and those lovely words of um, the uh, a, a, a Joshua um, Heschel, um, who said, an individual dies when they cease to be surprised. An individual dies when they cease to be surprised. I'm surprised every morning when I see the sunshine again. And when I see an act of evil, I don't accommodate I don't accommodate myself to the violence that goes on everywhere. I am still so surprised. And that is why I am against it. We must learn to be surprised. Mm-hmm. You've um, certainly helped our curiosity, and, uh, and this has been a, a surprising uh, conversation and um, a very beautiful conversation. I know I want to leave the last few words to you because there's a there are some people you want to um, surprise. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not too big a surprise. <laughs> but thank you very much, Paul. Oh, I really my, appreciate my it. My absolute pleasure. Yeah. So I'm, I'd just like to finish by, by reading the acknowledgements from, from the begin, beginning of the book. This is a, a ploy so that I don't forget any names. <laughs> uh, but Isaac Newton famously said that if, it had, if he had seen further, it was by standing on the shoulders of giants. I would like to begin by acknowledging the many authors upon whose work I have drawn and who are cited in this book's references. Many friends and colleagues have contributed to this work by reading drafts and discussing the book's arguments as the manuscript evolved. I owe an enormous debt to Tom Arnold, Helmut Beck, Doug Bennett, Frederick Burkle, James Colgan, Sandy Dunlop, Garrett Ellis, Graham Fermello, Sean Goff, Kitty Holland, Therese Hume, Jason Jang, Rob Call, William Kerr, Steen Christensen, Paula McGuire, Cathy Moore, Barry O'Donnell, Elizabeth Micah, Elaine O'Malley Dolanup, Henry MacDonald, Kate O'Neill, Raymond O'Neill, Joachim Peach, John Sutton, Alan Taylor, Brian Trench, and Rachel Weiss. Particular thanks are due to friends Grania Murphy, Alan Villiver, Pat Nolan, Sean O'Driscoll, and Roger Duck. So from that list, you can see that what Paul was saying at the beginning, that no one does this alone now. <laughs> uh, John Barry, who we heard from, Jan Rosier, Kieran Kuan, and Silda Langford played pivotal roles at various points in the process. My sincere gratitude to all of you. Ian Brunswick and on Orla Ross from the Science Gallery, I'd like to thank for, for their generosity in hosting it this evening. And also to Stephen Pinker, Jeffrey Sachs, and former President Mary McAleese, who gave such gener- generous re- uh, endorsements. I'm extremely lucky to have as my agent Tracy Brennan, whose inspiration and support go beyond the call of duty. Tracy has been a true partner in the making this book happen. Special thanks also to the staff at Zero Books. I owe a special debt of gratitude to John Hunt for his belief in this book from day one. Finally, special thanks to my mother, the earth on which I walk, and to my siblings and extended family. Their love and encouragement are the bedrock of my life and career. 
this book would not have been written without you. In my last conversation with my father before he passed away, he asked me how this book was progressing. I'm working on it, I said. You'd better get on with it, was his reply. <laughs> so here it is, Dad. This is for you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. An absolute pleasure. The book is the book is launched. I think <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be here to to sign. Yeah. 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 I think um, it was a very insightful and full of food for thought for the future as well. Um, I'd just like to thank Ian and Paul again uh, for a wonderful conversation. Uh, the books are available um, for a signature, hopefully. Uh, if Ian's willing to stay around. And if you want to just pay um, with the bookshop down here. Thank you very much. I'm putting hands together for Ian and Paul again.